The gospel is taken from John chapter 14, and I'll be reading from verses 15 to 22. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you often. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. A very good morning to all of you who are watching this live streaming and uh, welcome to this morning's worship service. I'm glad that we can share together at least virtually, especially in these very difficult times. But we thank God for every opportunity he gives us where we can use technology to our advantage in meeting and sharing the love of God, the God whom we serve is sovereign and he's alive and he's with us. He said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. And so we are encouraged this morning that the spirit of God is with us even as we worship him. Before we look into God's word, can we look to the Lord to lead and guide and direct us? Father God, we thank you this morning that we can come to you the God of all comfort, the God of mercy, the God who loves us with an everlasting love. Lord, speak to us even as we open the pages of your word. And as we listen to your word, activate in us, Lord, a love for your word. Activate our will, Lord that we will be open to the Spirit of God speaking to us. Minister to us, O God, at this time. Remove all distractions and all those thoughts of conflict or those thoughts which try to distract us, Lord, and help us to stay focused in listening to your word. We give you thanks, we love you, and we worship you, and we surrender ourselves to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The, my topic for this morning's sermon is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Dr. Paul Brand, who wrote the book with Philip Yancey, Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants, was an orthopedic surgeon who worked with leprosy patients trying to reconstruct the damage that leprosy had upon those patients with their bones. He was speaking to a medical college in India on Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In front of the lectern was an oil lamp with its cotton wick burning from the shallow dish of oil. As he preached, the lamp ran out of oil, the wick burned dry, and the smoke made him cough. He immediately used the opportunity. Some of us, he said, here are like this wick. We are trying to shine for the glory of God, but we find ourselves inadequate. 
That's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel of our witness rather than the Holy Spirit. Wicks can last indefinitely, burning brightly and without irritating smoke if the fuel, the Holy Spirit, is in constant supply. Let me give you the context of this passage that was read, that I just read. Jesus was telling his disciples that he was about to depart from them and go back to the Father after spending close to three and a half years of, of ministry. This was a farewell discourse when Jesus was speaking to his disciples on the night of the Last Supper in the upper room as they were all reclining around that low table. The Lord was teaching them important things to prepare them for the hours of darkness at his crucifixion. This may be close to about 12 hours before he was crucified. And uh, John's gospel captures it in, in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. These were literally last instructions or last words of Jesus. Soon they would be going to the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ would be arrested. And in John chapter 13, we read about the departure of Judas to start with, with the Lord telling the rest of the disciples that they will all fall away and that Peter would deny him three times. I can imagine what kind of situation or what was the scene in that room. Sadness, fear, anxiety, gloom as they listen to the words of Jesus. But Jesus, in the midst of that great battle that lay ahead, was concerned about his disciples whom he loved. He says to them in chapter 16, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for I, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let's unpack the farewell discourse where Jesus introduces to the disciples the third person of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit, for the first time in the gospel. John records Jesus saying to his disciples in verse 16, I will send you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Two words are key. One is another and the other is helper. Now the English word is paraclete, but we do not want to go into too much of Greek. And is translated, I'll try to make it as simple as possible, is translated as advocate. Some translation says comforter. Some says counselor. And so, in essence, what we are saying is the paraclete was someone you called to come alongside you and me and help us in our defense during a trial. We see this played out in the life of the apostles in the book of Acts when Jesus rose from the dead and after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were sharing Jesus. And all through wherever they went, they were proclaiming the power of the risen Lord. And then the authorities shut them up, asked them to shut up, stop proclaiming the word. And they threw them in prison to stand before the magistrates. But then the Holy Spirit gave them boldness. And they went on to say, we would rather be obedient to God rather than man. See, the, the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is a very misunderstood doctrine. And it is important for us to get it right. The Holy Spirit's ministry and identity is the same as that of Jesus. There is no discrepancy, conflict, or dispute of any kind between the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who lives the life of Jesus Christ within us and who desires to express the character of Jesus Christ through us. A person is not a Christian because his or her sin has gone, but because the Holy Spirit has come. Paul wrote 
If anyone does not have the Holy Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Therefore, we need to ask ourselves the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Let's look at what he is not. He is not an it. He is not a source of power or a force or an influence. Neither is he the antivirus. It is interesting that throughout the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is not given a personal name, but is described in terms of his work. We must not see him as something, but as someone. He is a person. He has a will. He has a mind. And he has emotions. Mm. The Holy Spirit does not have a physical body, and neither does, the Ho does God the Father. But he is a distinctive person like God the Father. He is one in substance and yet uniquely distinctive. It must also be recognized that he is God. He is not just a servant of God or an agent of God, but he is God. He possesses divine attributes that belong exclusively to God. He is omnipotent, which is he's all powerful. He, he is all knowing, which is omniscient. And he is omnipresent, that is, he is in all places at the same time. He is eternal, which means he has no beginning and no end. But for a Christian, a Christian who, who believes in Jesus Christ, he is, he, is, he is everlasting. That is, he has no end because he has received eternal life, which is the life life of God. He creates, as we see in the book of Genesis, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters in Genesis 1 verse 3. He is sovereign. He is the one who gives the gifts, spiritual gifts to the church of Jesus Christ. He is the author of prophecy. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon kings upon prophets, upon priests for a season, and then departed. But now after the day of Pentecost, Jesus says, he will be with you, and he will be with you and in you permanently. But you know something? You and I, as followers of Jesus, can grieve the Holy Spirit, we can quench the Holy Spirit, and even lie to the Holy Spirit. You see this very clearly uh, recounted for us in the Acts of the Apostles. Now let's look at the second question. What is the Holy Spirit's role in the life of a believer, in the one who's put his faith who, in Jesus Christ, in one who is a follower of Jesus? You see, we became followers of Christ when the Holy Spirit brought us to our knees by convicting us of self-righteousness and our inadequacy and pointing to us to a righteousness which is only in Jesus Christ by faith. He then puts a seal of ownership on us and gives us his Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is permanent in the life of the believer. The world will not understand the Holy Spirit, my friend, because John 1.10 says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. I believe that there is a sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Number one, he is my helper, and he helps me in my daily walk with God, causing me to bear fruit as he well equips me with gifts also to build up the church of Jesus Christ. Two, he convicts the world of sin, thus pointing to us a need of a savior so that we will believe in him, of righteousness, which means right standing with God, and of judgment. Why? Because the rule of this world is already judged, talking of Satan. The Lord Jesus is going to strip the enemy of 
are souls of all his authority over you and me. Thirdly, he is a spirit of truth who guides us into all truth and creates in us an appetite for the word of God and a love for Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible. It is the Holy Spirit who illumines the word and who applies the word of God with power so that it cuts between bone and marrow as found in Hebrews 4 verse 12. Fourthly, he speaks to us as he spoke to Paul. He intercedes for us and helps us in our prayer, daily prayer life. <clears throat> Sometimes we struggle, we do not know what to pray. But the Holy Spirit helps us in our journey of prayer. He who reads our mind, he who knows our spirit, guides us through those difficult times when we find prayer, not just the words, but the very act to pray becomes difficult when we go through difficult times. He regenerates in us Jesus, as Jesus mentioned um, in his conversation with Nicodemus in, as found in, in, in the Gospel of John. Where Paul, and then Paul tells us also in, in Romans 8, 11, that he, he regenerates us. It is the Holy Spirit who also exposes falsehood. We see this played out in the life of Ananias and Sapphira in, in Acts of the Apostles. Number six, the Holy Spirit is given to indwell the believer, to fill you and me with power, to overcome sin and temptation, as well as give us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Seventhly, the Holy Spirit makes us radically different, energizing us with joy and giving us boldness and courage to defend the name of Christ as he did with the apostles and the evangelists to do great works of service for the glory of God. We looked at who's the Holy Spirit. We looked at what the, what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. Thirdly, what is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is living within you and me? This is the question that Paul posed to some people who call themselves disciples during his visit to Ephesus on his third missionary journey in Acts 19. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul asked. They answered him, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Later, Paul prayed for them and they received the Holy Spirit. In closing, this is the question that the Lord is asking you and me this morning. In Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit works from the inside out. I will look at three areas. We'll show evidence that he is in residence and present, president of our life. Number one, one of the uh, evidence is that there will be a changed attitude in my life to people. Paul says, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Instead, we look at everyone as one made in the image of God. And the love of God will cause you and me to love people without bias or prejudice or judging them or condemning them. My brother and my sister, love is more than a feeling toward people we love. It's an attitude even towards those we do not like or get along naturally. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and the expressions of love is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness. And this is what happens when the Spirit of God lives in you and me. The second evidence will be there will be a changed attitude towards circumstances. We're all going through very, very difficult times during this pandemic. And as a Christian, you and I will not be exempt from trials and difficulties. But the Holy Spirit gives us a different perspective to our problems. We are all vulnerable to sicknesses and viruses that can rob us of our joy, disturb our peace, and exhaust our patience. 
And Paul reminds us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the promise of God is the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The third evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in you and me is that there will be a change attitude to ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. There are many things that try to control us, especially in this day and time. It could be bad habits. It could be greed. It could be selfishness. It could be pride. The Holy Spirit convicts and urges us to flee from bondages that can enslave us and hinder our bodies to serve as a temple of the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul told the Corinthians to examine themselves to see whether they are in the faith. Test yourselves, he said. My brother and my sister, if you're a follower of Christ, and like the folks in Ephesus said, they have not heard the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that you can invite him by faith to be not only the resident in your life, but to preside in your lives from this day forward and experience the fullness of his presence to be fruitful and, if, and an effective witness for Christ. If you're not a Christian, I would encourage you to invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life by faith. Scripture says, he who comes to me, I will in no wise despise. This can be your day of salvation and no matter what happens to you, you can realize the promise of God who says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where, I'm, where I am, you may be also. Let me end with this quote from C.S. Lewis. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Amen.